Hi, I'm Sarah Glassberg. I'm Brad Pilcher. And this is HAFF In Conversation, the Jewish film podcast. Sarah, the festival started. It's pretty crazy that it's here. Yeah, it feels really different. It feels incredibly different. I'm exhausted. Are you exhausted? I'm I'm very exhausted. Yeah, but it's a different kind of exhaustion. It's not that running around from theater to theater. Um, you know, it's it's different. Yeah, one thing that it's important, I think, for festival goers to know is we we do a lot of work before every festival. So I don't want to diminish that in a regular year. But this year, because the festival is all is almost all virtual, we we have drive-ins, obviously, but because so much of the festival is virtual, we have worked maybe two or three hundred percent harder on the lead up to the festival. So now that the festival is here, we've already recorded all these Q and A's um, we've already got the films all lined up and they're queued up to be, you know, available online so you can watch them at home. So there's so much more work that happened at the beginning of the year before the festival even started. So now the festival is here, we're still running around. We've got drive-ins, we're rescheduling one, we're doing all this other stuff, but we're not running around physically, but we're all we're like, we're coming in almost like the walking wounded to the beginning of this festival um, because there's so much going on we're all super excited, but we're also like stuck at home just like everybody else and really, really tired. I don't even know what day it is um, without looking at a calendar. I was just going to say that I think the adrenaline is coming from different sources, though. I think the thing that keeps you going in a typical year, um, even after all of the prep and and how tiring it is, is seeing the the audience and and for me it's always been greeting the guests and getting to see some of the Q and A's and and all of that good stuff and now the the adrenaline actually I would argue has been a little sustained because we've been so many of us have been you know on the front lines watching these Q and A recordings as they're happening and so you get to also see some of the behind the scenes there and it's it's exciting it is tiring um, to your point but um, that. I think I've been sustained by kind of this different type of adrenaline, these different sources and the timeline is again, it's, it's shifted, but, um, but that's definitely been keeping me going. And, and now we are getting to hear the audience's reactions in different ways to what we've been working on. Yeah. It's nice to be able to finally share some of this stuff because we, like I guess, like you said, we have, I have seen all the Q&As. I have sat in on all the Q&A. Like I've watched them in real time um, as we were recording them. You have as well. And I could say to people, oh, you're going to love this Q&A. You're going to love that Q&A. But I didn't, you know, they didn't have a chance to see it yet, um, which is weird and different. So it is nice to be able to hear from people. The festival started. They can watch stuff. They're getting excited. That that excitement is sort of going to carry us and sustain us. But we're not, we're not in the lobby of the theater talking about a Q&A that just happened, we are at home and the Q&As are all, you know, queued up to drop on YouTube. Um, speaking of Q&As that are dropped, dropping on YouTube, our first one, we're recording this on day two of the festival. Um, opening night was last night. As of noon today, there are two Q&As that can be watched, one for Kiss Me Kosher, one for Sublet. Um, but there are others coming down the pike and the Kiss Me Kosher Q&A is what we're actually going to play as today's podcast. We wanted to give people a chance, if you're a podcast subscriber especially, maybe you missed it last night. Um, we wanted to point out to people that you can watch these Q&As whenever you want for free. There are spoilers in them, so you might want to wait and watch the movies first. But today, we're going to actually take the audio from the Kiss Me Kosher Q&A, which is one of those Q&As that I was saying to people, it's amazing. It is absolutely um, phenomenal. Um, I can't wait for people to hear it. And we're going to just play that audio. That's going to be today's episode. But before we get into that, I, you and I should take some time to talk about all of what we've got for people in the world of Q&As at the festival this year. Yeah, definitely. I mean, as you pointed out, you know, it's really nice to be able to offer these on AJFF.org. Um, they're going to be coming out at the same time as the respective film releases um, in our virtual cinema. So there's a lot of flexibility there. Um, and as you said, and as I mentioned, um, these conversations have just been so fulfilling to listen in on. I think our audience is going to be 
feel really um, fulfilled by them. I think so many of them, the Kiss Me Kosher one in particular, they're so entertaining, they're insightful. Um, and we've got star power. I mean, in a in a year where so much, you know, there are so many physical barriers, as we've talked about on this podcast, um, there were a lot less barriers when it came to the guest programming. And so that has, again, been something that's been so magical about this year, honestly. I mean, we had Howie Mandel for our closing night film. We hosted a conversation with the brilliant Shira Haas. Um, and we've had legends like Robbie Benson for the show, The Chosen. We've had um, Tova Feldshu, who I'm such a fan of, and she participated on a panel about the documentary on Broadway. So there is a lot coming. Um, and these conversations have been, again, just so rich and really span time zones and just the whole world really and so it makes it makes things feel more connected in a year where again we're kind of losing some of that so yeah. well we had ron rifkin i mean there's so many there's there's so many so we had ron rifkin for the minion my personal favorite uh just because i'm a huge fan of his work is john carroll lynch who is um an actor who's in the film kiss me kosher he was part of the q a that q a was huge it had the producer it had um three or four of the actors in the film had the writer director, but John Carroll Lynch is like, to my mind, one of the great character actors of modern film. Um, I, I think he should have gotten a, a nomination for best supporting actor for the founder about the origins of McDonald's, but he's just amazing. And to be able to sit in a virtual room with him while he was doing the Q and a for me is a special thing, but you're right. There are so many stars. Shira Haas, I think did our Q and a recording like right after she'd been nominated for the golden globes. Um, so she was coming in off that high and she wasn't doing a lot of, of, of press, I think for, for Asia, the film, it's just amazing to be able to have that. And I know for a fact, we would never have been able to fly all those people in to a regular in-person festival they would not have been able to participate we would not have been able to have their voices in the room and now we can which is great um we also had great great um moderators and we you know were able to bring in star power on that front too the one that we're going to be listening to today is moderated by um holly furfer cnn correspondent she was great um but we've got incredible other hosts that have also um done amazing um, you know, Q and A guesting. I'm thinking about um, Brighton Beach, which was which had a which another one which was also just absolutely huge uh, in terms of who was involved. It had you had, I think, four or five of, of the actors uh, uh, from that film. Um, but Judy Gold, comedian and, and writer, Judy Gold was the moderator for that, which was also a great one. So I mean, just, there's so much star power to it. But there's just we were able to have larger Q and A's. We were able to have longer Q and A's. It really does, I think, make this year's festival um, that much more special than a, than a regular festival. Because in a regular festival, Q and A, fifteen minutes, you know, and and oftentimes it's two or three people max up on stage. Um, but we were able to bring in a lot more people, which is just incredibly exciting. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Again, I think this, I think Kiss Me Kosher is a great representative. Um, example of our Q&As this year to share with the podcast listeners because, again, it I think we had guests from ranging from LA to Hawaii to Tel Aviv to Berlin to other parts of Germany. I mean, it was just really cool. And the Brighton Beach Memoirs one as well. I mean, that was a true reunion. We had all four actors who played the the, the children and this was the first time that they saw each other all like all together for since years ago um, and you really felt that come through and Judy Gold of course was fantastic so so again there is just so much to be excited for and um, I think Kiss Me Kosher was just such a great kickoff to the festival and this conversation in particular I mean I'm just thinking back to like our our webinars that we did uh, the in conversation webinars and we would sometimes put those in the podcast you know feed and those were long conversations, 45, 50, 45 minutes, 50 minutes. And this, this Kiss Me Kosher conversation is right around there. So you just get so much from all the different uh, panelists participating, so many fun little behind the scenes things, talking about the themes of the film. I mean, it, these are just really rich, um, I think, especially compared to uh, a normal year where, yeah, we're flying people in and it's great to be in a room with them. But I think Zoom um, and all these digital technologies that we're forced to kind of use to connect with each other 
I, again, I can't say quite enough um, from the guest programming side um, about how connected I have felt to these films and to these experts and actors and filmmakers um, so, so much compared to a regular year. So there are really these silver linings. And I think that's going to come through for listeners when they um, check out this Kiss Me Kosher uh, Q&A right now. We, I, I should make a point too for our listeners. You deserve a lot of credit. Um, you worked very closely with Dory Stegman um, to coordinate getting all of this guest talent, which was an Herculean effort at a time of year when you were also doing other Herculean things that you would not normally have had to do uh, to this degree. And Amy Linton, uh, who is a world-class editor who's edited films from the festival, uh, worked with us to edit all of these Q and A's to get them super polished. So they look, they are, they were recorded using zoom, but they don't look like zoom calls. Um, they look phenomenal. Um, and that really is a credit to the team that, that helped put this together of which you were a lead part. So kudos to you, Sarah, and thank you for doing that because, um, when we sat down and talked about what we were going to do with guests at the beginning, I was a little scared because I, I thought we could do it. I knew we could do it, um, but I knew it was going to be ambitious um, to try to get as many people to get as much talent to to get them to line up their schedules and to record. I mean, we did this all really in about three weeks uh, from the first recording that we did to the last recording that we did. There was obviously some extra time in there for editing and things like that, but it, we were able to knock out just an enormous amount of of content uh, in terms of recording it and, and organizing it and, and getting everybody together at the same time across time zones, as you mentioned. Um, and that's that was ambitious. Um, and I, thankfully, was not the person who had to sort of make all that happen. You, uh, you and Kenny, our executive director, and Dory, uh, and then of course Amy's incredible editing. So, uh, kudos to them. Kudos to you, especially. Um, it's a, it's a big achievement. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, I think it's the, like the festival is always a team effort. There's so many different pieces that go into this puzzle to bring amazing films and these amazing other programs that go with the films um, to our audience. And I'm, again, I'm sustained by the fact that our audience, I think, is going to just, the, the films are going to be so enhanced by what we've done with guest programming this year. And I, I can't wait to hear the audience's reactions again, not not in person, unfortunately, but um, as always, while it is exhausting to put on the AJFF, um, it is so incredibly rewarding. And again, I really think that's going to come through as you listen to the Kiss Me Kosher conversation in particular and all the Q&As. Like I said, we, we definitely encourage people to go check out ajff.org uh, slash Q&A to see when those are releasing and to to check them out. They're really good. As we as we have been saying, they are just really, really good conversations. They really are. And and they're they're all on the website. They're also going to be on our YouTube channel. So if you are a subscriber to to AJFF on YouTube, you will just see them drop into your feed automatically. Um, they'll all be on the website and they're free and, and you can watch them for they're going to stay up. So they're not time limited. You can watch them whenever. Um, it is great. But for now Enjoy Kiss Me Kosher. Enjoy this incredible Q and A that dropped just um, just last night as part of opening night. It is um, it is phenomenal. It is full of of talent. I mean, literally, I think it may be one of our biggest, if not our biggest. It has uh, Holly Furfer moderating, Christine Gunter, who is a producer on the film, the writer director Cheryl Peleg. It had the actors John Carroll Lynch. It had Rivka Macheli. It had Moran Rosenblatt. It had Louise Wolfram. It, it it is it is just it is just a delight to listen to and now you can enjoy it on this podcast what an incredible film welcome to our talk back after the opening night premiere and in the north american premiere of that fabulous movie kiss me kosher again i'm holly furfer and i have with me our very honored guests. I'm going to run through our little Brady Bunch box on the screen. Uh, Cheryl Peleg, I hope I pronounced that right, Cheryl, uh, writer and director of the film. Christine Gunter, uh, producer of the film. And let me say that we are crossing, we are international because Cheryl is in Berlin. Christine is in Maui. We have the phenomenal actors. I mean, 
Th this film, uh, unbelievable. Uh, Moran Rosenblatt from Tel Aviv, Louise Wolfram from uh, Germany, Ina, Germany. Now you have to Google that. Rivka Micheli from uh, Tel Aviv and John Carroll Lynch in Los Angeles. We're global. We're taking over. Welcome, everybody. Hi. Hi. Good to see you all. Okay, so first, I just want to start, Cheryl, with you. Um, you know, you wrote the film, uh, directed the film. This is your brainchild. Talk about how this came to be. I mean, you threw everything in there. We're talking LGBTQ. We're talking the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the Holocaust. I mean, everything that you could talk about, you put in there and successfully. So wh where did this whole idea come from? Um, my life. <laughs> uh, it's actually... I think it's it's very natural with your first film to throw everything you are and you've experienced and you kind of want to uh, um, um, oh god I'm in, I'm in German in my head for uh, Arbeit <laughs> I still have to switch um, really? yeah it's I think it's a first film thing that you just you use what you know basically and that's that's what I did and. Um, did you ever wonder, did you ever think, well, maybe this is too much? Or did you ever think, oh, I went over the line? Or did you just think, I'm all the time, all out there? All the time. I was just waiting for apps, for someone to come and say, come on, reduce a little less. But no one did. So I kept on going. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And uh, let me ask you, Christine, as the producer, you know, when you get something, a project like this with everything in it, and we know there's hot button issues, but there's so much comedy, it's poignant. Um what was what 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 about this project attracted you to it? Well, the more the merrier. I really like the the balagan of all those influences and all those elements. And um, <clears throat> I, for me personally, um, uh, I think um, yeah, the conflict lines were just so timely. Uh, that lava overcomes division and hate and um, that there's uh, space for different um, points of views and opinions and uh, ways of living and that they're not necessarily um, uh, pitted against each other, but uh, have a right to coexistence. This is what drew me to the project. And of course, Shirel's um, excellent writing. It was brilliant. Um, let me throw it to Moran and Louise. So the two of you, had you met before this? Because your chemistry was undeniable. It was so wonderful watching this. And what drew both of you to the project? I'll start um, with you, Moran. Me. Um, so me and Louise uh, met for the first time uh, in the match, in the mutual audition we did in Germany. Oh, she came. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Special surprise guest. <laughs> So big. Um, <laughs> so we met uh, in the mutual audition. I went to Germany for like uh, 24 hours to do the audition. And we did um, this very long uh, audition together. Um, and then we met like a week before uh, shooting in rehearsals. And I have to say that we we had this click um, really at the beginning of the rehearsals. I felt really, really comfortable uh, with her. And Louise, what drew you to this project when you read that script? What did you what 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 was it that you said, I, I want this part? I'm going to audition for this part. Like the humor she put in the script, it's, I don't know, I think Germans are not very famous for their humor, I guess, worldwide scene. So, <laughs> no? I'm very, I guess it is like that. Um, and I was really glad to have, a, yeah, like a funny script. I also do a lot of serious stuff and also historical stuff. And, and I thought, oh my God, this character is kind of close to me also in a way. Interesting. And uh, Rivka, I want to turn to you, um, your character, uh, just grandma, I think we all of us have experienced somebody like that in our families, especially in the Jewish world. Um, your character really, uh, she's kind of almost the influence of, of the, the theme of it. She struggles so much with the past um, and it really interrupts the present and the future for her. Um, what was it about this character that drew you to, to this role? 
I think that uh, this person has uh, many dimensions. It's not a stereotype. And it's not just an old uh, grandma who survived. It's more than that. She's very open and she accepts her grandchild, uh, uh, granddaughter as she is. But the only reluctance when she becomes very aggressive is when uh, her uh, best friend is from German. Because she carries... Best terribly. friend, Rivka? Best friend? Best <laughs> <laughs> Your best is German and I could speak. And I was very nasty to her. But I had my own secret because I was in love with an Arab man. And this is not acceptable uh, in a uh, normal Israeli society. The match uh, between these two people is hard for young people, it is hard for old people. I think you're covering your microphone a little bit with your hand. But now he's directing. I love it. <laughs> Do you hear me now better? That's better, oh, much better, better, yeah. Better, thank you. But I have not seen any further. <laughs> I said all. Mm -hmm. That is all. Well, <laughs> now much better. And um, John, I do, I want to turn to you. So um, from the American perspective, what was it about that role that kind of drew you to that role? Because he seemed to me the most unbending one, the one who sort of didn't, um, see the light at the end of the day. So, and, and how much about, you know, how much about what's going on, you know, the, the settlers and the, and the conflict over there, how much of that did you know about before the movie was engaged with or learn about during the process of filming this? Well, uh, first, the script was hilarious. It made me laugh and, and it was so ambitious in its comedy. It was, uh, it was driving straight towards things that normally aren't handled by humor. And, and also, it felt as comedies like this, brave comedies like this do, they have an opportunity for change that drama simply does not have. Um, to me, sometimes experiencing drama reinforces feelings, but doesn't change them. And a comedy has the opportunity to, uh, to fully uh, integrate the humanity of each of the individual players each of the individual characters in a way that that drama often doesn't. And uh, this script was ambitious in that way. And I, I loved that about it. Um, as far as the uh, the um, the uh, settlement issues are concerned, and and uh, uh, I can't speak for an American perspective because, uh, let's face it, uh, there are several. Um, but from my own perspective, um, I was aware of uh, the difficulties with uh, the um, the settlements and and the um, continued um, erosion of Palestinian land uh, as as Israel makes decisions around that um, and uh, uh, and what I found interesting in coming to the material was looking on a lot bunch of YouTube things that were sent to me and that I searched out uh, around <laughs> fantastically hilarious terrifying men who drive around <laughs> uh, uh, on ATVs with sidearms and uh, uh, accents that you would hear five miles outside of Atlanta. Uh, <laughs> and they're talking about how important they are <laughs> to the peace and security of Israel. <laughs> Which, which is awful and hilarious to me. It was just so funny watching them. I mean, I, I know they're completely serious about it. And I don't question their, their <laughs> desires. But for me, I just could not stop laughing at these, these, these people. And, and to be able to embrace that uh, as, a, as an ethos and to take it seriously as a character and for that seriousness to be funny made sense to me. I love that. And Cheryl, what, what about, I mean, obviously you used a lot of humor in this. Talk about why it was so important and how you balance that with the seriousness of the topics that you're, that you're talking about. Well, I don't think you can actually separate these two. Uh, they, they just go hand in hand. That's, that's how I see the world in a way. Um, and I just let myself put it out there the way I see it. The thing is that 
these are topics that are not only on TV or in the books. They, they have an influence in our day-to-day lives. And that was at the center of this, trying to figure out how to touch topics that are usually considered taboo, but somehow are very much alive uh, um, for us. And one of the things that really struck me in the movie, when you talk about humor with seriousness, Louise, your character in the at the museum, when you talk with um, Moran's character and you're outside and you talk about what it's like to be a German, when we're talking about that whole issue of the Holocaust. And I mean, that really struck me because it really opened my eyes that the whole world is able to to approach that topic through a certain lens. But many German people cannot. Is that something that touched you that you personally have experienced? And was that sort of eye-opening to you as well? Totally. The moment I read this line, I thought for the first time, that's true. Like I never had it that clear in my mind. And I was really moved by this line in a way. And, and I was, while playing it, I really, I just played it as me as I am actually, like in this moment. And it was also like, in, kind of a relief in this moment to speak out loud this kind of thought, which I feel, but I haven't thought before. Interesting. And I'm curious with the other actors, you know, did you feel the same thing too? I mean, just because you weren't in the scene, but I would love Rivka, John, your perspectives as well. Moran, uh, from, from, from that topic as well, sort of those eye-opening aha moments. I'm, 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 I'm kind of seeing what Louise said now, uh, that you realize the, um, the guilt of German uh, according to what had, has happened and the guilt that um, either e- even that she didn't do anything. Um, when John just talked about the settlers, I, um, I realized that even though I'm not, uh, I'm not a settler, of course, and um I'm on the left side of the of the pol- pol- poli- poli- political uh, map. I uh, still felt uh, the guilt of the Israeli people. So I really understand what Louise said now. Yeah, somehow it's it's a very personal topic, but at the end, it's also it's it's a national thing, you know. Because I I am an Israeli, even though I live in Berlin, I I will always be an Israeli. And uh, even when you're in Germany and you, uh, if you're, you go out of Germany and you're German, you're still German in a way. And we take this, this role with us wherever we go. You see, I was born in Israel and so were my parents. And they, even from my mother's mother's side, I'm ninth generation in Israel, in Palestine, in Israel. And I can tell you that only five or more years ago, I decided to buy German products. Before then, I never buy, buy bought a, a, a German product. I was reluctant of everything that was German. And in, it's in my blood. I think I was educated and uh, I saw survivors. I saw children in my class. They were orphans and they were not so accepted well in Israel when the first came to Israel. I can tell you the, the, the refugees that survived. But then uh, it took me time to understand that there, are, there is another generation and this new generation doesn't have to carry this guilt. And if we hope that it will never uh, happen again, we should look to the future. I'm also, uh, I would say, relaxed uh, when I see uh, what Israel is. Israel is the regime now. We hope it will change, like the, what happened to Trump. We always uh, compare the both Bibi and Trump, and uh, maybe it will change. I don't know, not many chances, because ours is much cleverer. <laughs> he's clever, isn't he? He's not uh, as uh, your uh, your friend before, but uh, I, I, I'm I'm talking about every Israeli has some guilt, according 
to our situation, being being here in a, a part of, of, of this Middle East and they being so different from our neighbors. Mm. Uh, I think uh, this will carry, and this is when I'm in love with an Arab uh, a, a doctor, and I, I always uh, have jokes about it between uh, uh, me and him, and still, it is not very comfortable, still. And John, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I was in uh, Germany for a film festival in Hamburg, and I was walking around a park, and there was a a war memorial. And it started with a World War I memorial, and then it was a, a World War II memorial about 10 years after the war. And then there was another World War II memorial right next to it, which was a shattered swastika. And, um, and in each of them was a kind of digestion and consideration of the circumstances of each of those individual experiences and how they're changing over time as they're, as they're confronted and, and uh, meditated on. And um, we are, uh, you know, obviously the United States and uh, our systemic racism is something that uh, is, um, is denied by many people and is uh, fought over by many people and uh, literally uh, to some degree was the cause of the attack on the Capitol. Um, uh, it, uh, and uh, and in those circumstances, we're not coming to terms with that. We're not digesting that. We're not looking at it. We're we're either ignoring it or screaming about it, and that's the two sides that we have. In the in this film, the attempt to 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 point at the screaming and to see the cross currents of intolerance, like. I'm perfectly fine that my daughter is marrying a German. That's not a problem. I'm perfectly fine that my daughter is marrying a woman. That's not a problem. But when it comes to the Arabs, hold on. <laughs> like there's, it's, it's like ludicrous. The, the, the ludicrousness of arbitrarily assigning humanity to one group or another based on one's own perception is what the movie is pointing at in such a strong way. And, and it's funny. It's a silly thing to do. Uh, <laughs> and, and I appreciate the bravery of saying, this is just silly. We don't have time for this. We simply don't have time for it. We've got more important things to worry about. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and yet, uh, we're not doing that. Uh, and we're, uh, we, continue to, um, we continue to fight over things that we shouldn't be fighting over anymore. It's ludicrous, but it's important to 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 tell the truth before there's reconciliation. Right. And, and to that point, you know, Sherelle, you, you the whole the, the underlying theme to me was that how the past affects the present and the future. Right. And, and as John says, you see it through your own lens. So some people have issues with, you know, you mentioned the Holocaust or the settlers or, you know, everything seems to be intertwined. So talk a little bit about how you sort of based all of that on, you know, we, we have to remember the past, but we have to get beyond it if we want to live into the future. Yeah, I felt that I felt that in my private life. And I felt that while making this film that like, whenever you try to to do something that is based in in looking into the future, there is something, you know, this like, very heavy anchor pulling you down. And there's this kind of force to it that that there is no way to deal with actually, because no matter, and I feel it till today, I can be, I, I, my, my wife is German and we're together for over 11 years now. And she will always be the German. There's, there, the, it will never change, you know, and uh, in specific contexts. And I just ask myself, how, how can we release ourselves from that? How is reality how how is how is it possible for us to find a way to just be human beings when we communicate with each other and is it if at all possible in such a loaded situation where everything uh, uh collides and i feel that 
for me, it's very, it's very present, this issue. I'm sure that a lot of Americans can relate to it these days, that this kind of conflict, when it meets you at the dinner table with the people closest to you, where, where you find yourself not agreeing about uh, monumental issues like religion, politics, and how to get all of that mess uh, um, to actually function as a family, you know, while disagreeing. And that was that was the center of it for me to to find a way to continue to disagree. I don't want to change anyone's opinion. I don't care. I look at them as human beings and I want to be treated the same if I'm gay, Arab. I don't know. You know, it's it's it doesn't matter. It's just about being human beings, like John said before. And um, and I found it for me, the only way to look at it was with with putting the humor in its center and showing how basically impossible it is. Did you want to say something, Moran? Yeah, I, I thought when you said, uh, when you talked about uh, leaving the past behind uh, with all this this uh, serious uh, subjects, uh, the Holocaust and the, the, the Middle East problems, also putting the past behind is like in small things in a relationship, like the exes, like when I have so many exes and the girlfriend needs to just okay be 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 okay with it. It's that it's it's really difficult to put the past behind and it's really um it's really amazing if you succeed, of course. I can say something. Yes, um, please. We are on the eve of the International Memorial Day of the Holocaust. Tomorrow is the International Memorial Day uh, of Holocaust. So I read a lot. I hear music that was written and performed in, in Theresienstadt by a woman composer that was sent then to, to Auschwitz and was uh, terminated there. She and her son and her husband. And uh, I can't get over it like, uh, let's not think about the past because the past was there, and it always will be with us. I think uh, what we have to look forward is not to repeat these sorts of crime, never, never, and not be closer to these sorts of crime and atmosphere that brought people to do such unbelievable, unhuman deeds as they did, but still, as an Israeli, I will always remember what happened in the Holocaust. I can't get over it. Yeah, the, uh, not getting over it is, uh, I mean, I, I don't know why anybody would would assume that's a good thing, of getting over something like that. Um, it seems to me it has to be remembered and continued on. But, the, but to boundary things as if they're in, um, you know, as they're stuck in amber and nothing can change. Uh, we shot in uh, the old city of Jerusalem, and uh, and there's the Temple Mount in the background of one of the shots, and uh, uh, and that's a perfect tribute of the ongoing conversation around the series of historical events that uh, are still living out today, several thousand years or several hundred years later, depending on which one you want to choose. And um, when I, I I was at an event called the Blue Card. Uh, uh, fundraiser and the blue card is a group of New Yorkers who um, raise money for Holocaust survivors um, in the United States. I imagine mostly in the United States, and it's a it's, an, it's a generous uh, organization. They give a hundred percent of the funds. It's all volunteer. All of mine was the president emeritus, so we went and supported her as she got this award. And a woman got up, and it was right after Trump was elected, and uh, this woman got up and started talking about the fact that, uh, you know, that uh, Israel is uh, is uh, entitled to Sumerian Judea. And uh, and I was, uh, my head popped off. I was like, how far are we going to go back now? Like, you know, you're talking about Sumerian Judea now? Really? We're going, we're going, we're going, you know, that's a long that's time. How, that's how, it's, how Israelis call it. Till today. Sure, yeah. and, and the reason why they do that is because they're reaching backwards. Like, you know, I mean, it's it's an interesting it's an interestingly terrifying thing to justify our present behavior 
by something that happened several thousand years ago, as if it's extant oh, now, and and it happens Maybe. all the time. At the same time, we were shooting that scene with the Temple Mount. These young PAs were around trying to lock up the set, and the Orthodox community just simply ignored them. They would just walk straight through the walk straight to through the uh, through the lockup because they were entitled to be there, and these young people weren't. In their opinion, it seemed to me, from my outside perspective, I was like, wow, that's really super rude. Like these kids are just trying to, you know, like they're making, I don't know what they're making. They're probably volunteers and they're just trying to get a shot. You know, we're just trying to make a movie. You know, could you wait two minutes? Would would two minutes be too long? And apparently it was. No, so you, there's you, these... you say that it's rude, but I, I felt like I was, I was, I was stressed and I wanted to get out of there as fast as I could because I felt it's like, it, the one thing that we do that is going to go wrong here and the entire situation is going to go south because oh. there was something so loaded in the air with these with this group of men, you know, that just like had to be in the middle of the frame. Um, and the, oh. another thing oh. is we had as props, we had a huge cross. It, it didn't make it into the film in the end. <laughs> But there was a huge cross on set, like really a huge wooden cross carried by pilgrims. <laughs> So, um, yeah, and, and I know that like across, even in Jerusalem, it's Jerusalem people, it's not only ours, you know, <laughs> um, that was a big no-no and we were carrying it at the wrong side of, of the, uh, in the wrong side of the city, in the wrong quarter. And it never would have occurred to me, you know, but like I just saw them looking at this cross and I said, okay, we really have to get out of here because, um, yeah, that's, that's not looking good. Well, that... Lord, these histories can't be ignored. They can't just be walked away from. They're they're alive in us right now. The question I think the movie's trying to ask is how do we move forward with them? How do we carry those various crosses with compassion and and with uh, and new ones? Because you know, um, even though uh, uh, even though gay with gay people have been with us always, uh, this uh, this outward. Uh, outward expression uh, where where people are um, in love and want to be in love in public is new for us uh, generally. Like uh, in my lifetime, I, I went, this is in Atlanta. First time I was in Atlanta, I walked along. What's the big park in Atlanta? Olympia, uh, Centennial Olympic Park or Piedmont Park. Uh, one of the, two. Uh, the Piedmont, Piedmont, right? Mm -hmm. So I was walking in Piedmont Park and when I was 20 years old. I jumped forward uh, to a couple of years ago when I was working in Atlanta and there were uh, mixed race, uh, same sex couples walking hand in hand, kissing in that park in my lifetime. That had changed and rightly so. But these are new things for a lot of people who are intolerant towards them. And we can't ignore their intolerance. At the same time, we can't bow to it. I don't know what to do about it. But that's what's so great about the movie is it questions these things. It doesn't answer them. Right. Exactly. I think, and I think I, it's it's also, sorry for interrupting. No, I think go it's, ahead. A, it's really important for me to say that, like, at any point, it, it, there was n never an attempt to to say that someone is right or wrong or to force my opinion on anything. It was just, it's an attempt to show the absurdity of things. It, but but, it, it, there is a wedding. And everybody is so happy, but it ends with a big quarrel. <laughs> and I think it was not done by, by mistake, the quarrel. It was meant to be. Exactly. Right. There's no happy end in the, in the Middle East, yeah. <laughs> but that's how it, but, but it begs the question, and much to what John was saying, is that, you know, and, and what Rivka said, we have the past, and the past is so important to understand and keep with us in present and future, but not to guide us so much because we will become stalled. So how do you keep the past with you, but break away from the constraints that it has? Keep questioning it. I think that the past is as, or should, it isn't, but it should be as uh, um, alive and debatable as the present and the future. And I think that's the, that's an issue that we can seem to, to, to solve. And, you know, John was talking before about being in Germany and looking at different memorials and that's an amazing thing. And Germans are very good at, at remembering, but also in Germany, it stagnated in a way. And then we have, you know, this way of like this, but this is how we remember. So 
yeah, it's a good thing, but it's also a bad thing because if we stop asking questions, so we're not respecting the past, you know, because then it just stays in the past. So for me, it's and and if it's in regarding to to the German issue, Holocaust, whatever it is, you know, it just be we just need to talk about it. We just need to be able to to talk about things the way they are, which seems to be the hardest thing to do these days actually. <laughs> Luis, yeah. you wanted to say something? Yeah, I just had the feeling right now we, we're discussing like that. That is really, there was some point I enjoyed um, during the shootings a lot, like this really mixed people from all over the world with their different perspectives and ex um, experiences in their lives. And I mean, we probably could continue talking about all of this stuff for hours and hours because we all have our heritage and our origin and stuff and it's it, it was for me it was really something special to work in this like in an international context like this and to we had very good warm relations didn't we all of us we had very yes, warm we, did. we were really a group a family group if only we? you could be the microcosm to what would happen in the world. <clears throat> that would be perfect. Um, I do want to, Moran, I do have a question for you. Um, as, um, as a woman living in Israel, um, you know, we, we talk about same-sex marriage and in Israel, it's not legal yet, but 79% of the population wants and says it should be. They recognize same-sex marriage from outside. So how important was it for you to do this film there? And Luis, please, you know, jump in as well. But for you um, personally and, you know, to be able to do this film and the message that it sends. Uh, I think uh, in Israel, uh, people, like you said, uh, the, the, the majority are really, really accepting uh, um, the LGBT community, uh, some more, some less. Of, of course, the, the lesbian and, and homosexuals are in a better position now than uh, trans and like everywhere, I think. Um, um, of course, it's crazy uh, that we can't uh, get married. I think the... Um, um, the Rabbanut uh, in Israel, the, the, the um, um, group that's responsible for marriage in Israel is very religious and they control it since ever. And many, many people start to stop, uh, get married um, in the Rabbanut and start to get married um, uh, in more uh, um, uh, modern way. Uh, and um, and I think this is what's happening. The the, the new the, the young people get married, um, not in the religious way, and we started to maybe change things. Be but starting to get political is is not possible, and I'm so don't have the power to uh, to get in the 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 whole. Uh, uh, the 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 really strict religious people are have this um, um, this card uh, that they own uh, uh, and they decide many things here because they have uh, many people there and um, I don't want to get into the the hardcore of of politics but uh the majority of israel are really really cool especially in tel aviv um so yes it's only a law and yeah and we don't have civil marriage you know <clears throat> I think in israel it's the only country that a jew can't marry who we want <laughs> jewish people are not allowed to marry as they want it's the only country in the world but Rivka, you so in 1992, you did a movie, an incredible break, uh, groundbreaking movie, Amazing Grace. And that mm -hmm. addressed, um, you know, uh, the LGBTQ community way back then and even the AIDS uh, problem way back then. Okay, How have you... The director of the film died from AIDS. Right, uh, shortly after the film. 
How, yeah. But how have you then, as an actress and, you know, living in Israel, how have you seen things change? I mean, it's not, you, you have seen some progress. Of course, it changed completely. I think nobody has to hide, uh, unless they come from very orthodox families, then they they make them marry, you know, and they think that will heal them, as they say. And then you have tragic all over with families that they, the, the father is gay and he wants to separate and they, they wouldn't accept it, neither, nor his parents, nor the rabbis. And he, he feels very, and there are so many cases like this. But in the, uh, we, as, uh, we are three people, most of us, and not belonging to the Orthodox part of Israel, uh, you can be as, as you want. You know, it's very acceptable. As gay as you want. Yeah, as you know, gay. when I when I, I never came out, I was always very gay. <laughs> But at one point, my grandmother figured it out. <laughs> And she wasn't really okay with it. But I figured that things changed. You know, the, the ambience changed in Israel when she started comparing, you know, things like she would call me and say, do you know that Isabel's granddaughter got her sperm in Denmark? Why didn't you get your sperm in Denmark? <laughs> and then I was like, okay, things are developing. <laughs> and Louisa, Christine, and, and even Cheryl, um, Talk about it from the German perspective, living in another, you know, in a country, because even in the U.S., as progressive as we are, Europeans, I think, are very far, you know, forward. They're very progressive compared to a lot of what we have in the United States and definitely, I believe, in Israel. The, no. the gay parents in Israel are, you know, it's worldwide famous and the people come all over to Israel to celebrate the gay parade. Yeah. Yeah. Well, It's I mean, about Germany, <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> about Germany, I think uh, we all have our share of 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 crazy. We, of course, Berlin is a very, very liberal city. And um, um, in, in that regard, probably uh, the vibe is is as good as in in, in Tel Aviv. Um, but we also, of course, have super conservative forces and, and polarized forces who would love to turn back the clock and who would love to, to go back to, to an age where we all know our place, women and other religions and um, queer people. And uh, it's a constant struggle and it's a struggle in the here and now. And I think we all have to be, we have to stay um, vocal and, um, Uh, on our toes to to see how those forces globally in all societies develop. Um, and if you look back to the beginnings, to the Weimar Republic and to the 20s in, in Germany and to Magnus Hirschfeld and to all those people, I mean, it was so liberal, like um, uh, uh, gender expressions and the research in gender. It had its highlight in, in the 20s. And then it, it, there was this massive, like monstrous, pullback um, uh, uh, in, in liberal and civil rights and, of course, the monstrosities that happened in its wake. So uh, I think there is never a time to be, um, uh, to just let it go. I think we all have to, to watch out uh, what's going on and, and, and stay on top of it and, and be in discourse with people and not hide and not just, yeah. Do you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, um, yeah, that's totally right what, what you describe. And it's um, so this is the political um, issue and stuff. And but like what just came up in my mind, I um, it's very important also to like to build up a new viewing habit for the people, right? That you see in a cinema two women constantly kissing, and in the end, maybe before you thought. Uh, what uh, uh, I, I've never seen that in my private life because I don't have friends or something. But then you go out and you, you leave the cinema and you think, oh, yeah, of course they were kissing, just like two people kissing. So what the fuck? And I had friend of a friend was was in the cinema and she really described it afterwards. She she thought, wow, I, I never thought about it, but now I think maybe I'm gay because I saw that. <laughs> I think I missed that step in my puberty. And 
that's a nice effect of what what cinema or what a movie can can do like what, what the force of of movies and, and of pictures yeah. because we we all we have so many pictures we all consume every day and every minute and so the pictures we produced for this 90 minutes i'm i'm really proud of it and to, to be a part of it yeah. and also go ahead christine sorry thank you and also going back to what attracted me to to Shirai's script uh one of the one of the points was that um it doesn't pathologize the 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 queerness it doesn't pathologize being being lesbian and and that was very important to me this is the one thing that is that is not a problem in this yes. film that those <laughs> women are in love with each other and live this love and um yeah and and i thought that's how i want to how, how i want to look at things it is it is not a pathology and and i was very it, there was a time and place and there still of course is a time and place for for pictures that deal with coming out and the issues of coming out and the reaction of the family and all that but i wanted to produce a film where this is not the issue but everything else can be the issue I think we all want to live a little in a world where this is just a given, you know, it's not yeah. something you ride in the byline, even it's just, it's just the way it is. And know? I do think you got that. Yeah. One other thing about the, the movie like that. Yes. The one thing that everybody agrees on, regardless of their other problems is that these, these two women should be together. All of everybody agrees on that, but there's also the structure of the film itself, which is traditional. It's a traditional romantic comedy. It is girl meets girl, girl falls in love with girl, girl, they have a problem, they almost break up. And then they have that great scene at the end where they rush towards each other knowing they're their true loves. That's a really standard romantic comedy structure. And it's applied to a gay relationship and it works exactly the same way. So that is the reason why it had to be exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And that's why I loved, that's one of the reasons why I love the movies. It's really delightfully conventional. <laughs> in exactly. its structure. And, yeah, because you know the word it, conventional for gays is something that we never hear. And I was like, yeah. yes, you know, I, I want to be conventional. <laughs> for me, it's like <laughs> even this beautiful casting, these performances are wonderful, but they're also a, a lovely comedic mutton Jeff. There's one of them that's tall, and one of them that's not, and one of them that's light, and one of them that's dark, and they have different points of view. You're not tall, Moran. You're gorgeous. <laughs> And, and that's what was so great about it. They, their, their humor, the, the physical comedy of them together, of the things they did, all of those things are standard. They're standard routine comedic structures, and they're applied without any comment. It goes beyond because we're so – look, man, we've been watching these movies since, you know, it happened one night. They, these are old forms. Yeah. They're a hundred years old and they're being applied to this relationship and it doesn't change the form at all. And that's Thank you really for saying important. It. <laughs> goes beyond, it goes beyond simply showing it. It's literally applying it, applying a standard thing, a standard story. And, and also, it works. And I, I want to add the casting because I do think it's brilliant because everybody worked together. I mean, the, like I said, in the very beginning, Moran and Luis, your chemistry was undeniable. And, you know, that's what we look for in a rom-com, right? Or any romantic movie. And so, Sherelle, how important was it for you to find, and did you do it? The or, And Christine, did you have a part? The exact right people. I mean, the woman who plays the mom, who plays your wife, John, she just was lights out. Like every time she came on the screen, I think I leaned in like five feet because she just draws you in. The casting was brilliant. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, I have to say it's it was I did it hand in hand with Christina and and it was a lot of fun because I always knew that when I say, OK, this is the one she's going to say, you're right. And it worked like that the entire time. And it was wonderful to see, you know, this like, and I had this moment with each and every one of them. For me, it was clear when we started casting, there was never a debate. I said, the grandmother is Rivka Michaeli. Now get me Rivka Michaeli. That, that was the, the, the only thing I knew starting this. And thankfully she did. And I was so thankful that, that it worked out. Now I'm sorry. And I'm sorry that you didn't audition me because I would go to Berlin. 
<laughs> I'll have you here anytime, Rivka. <laughs> so I do have to ask you about something in the movie, the band. The band, as far as the film goes throughout, and, and it was brilliantly used as a subliminal sort of, here's where we are in this, but talk about why that was important to you. You know what? I can say so many things about it. The honest to God truth is, I don't know. It just had to be like that. <laughs> I, I I felt that it had to be like this because um, in a way, because the, the just technically, because the, there are so many issues and the plot keeps on going and there is a lot of verbal diarrhea, you needed a little break. And that was one reason where, where I felt that I needed this kind of break, but I wanted to stay in the comedy and I wanted to push it a bit further in, and be a bit more absurd in it. Because on the one hand, I really wanted to be a very uh, straight uh, uh, rom-com, but I needed some kind of quirkiness and this, this, these moments that were for me are very, very much Israeli that in the midst of the, this chaos, <laughs> when it comes to weddings, you always have this, you say in Hebrew, this like, it'll be fine, you know? And, um, and weddings are at the center of that, this feeling of no matter what happens, there's going to be a wedding and it's going to be happy and we're going to be joyful together. Um, and I think that's that's the reason why I really needed to have this this band there. Yeah, the band also gives a level of poetic uh, atmosphere to the film. When when it's there, it becomes more poetic, and it's nice that it's not straightforward all the time. Yeah, we're running out of time, but I want to throw a couple more quick questions, Moran. Let me ask you: What do you want people most to walk away after seeing this film with? fun yeah I think uh, um, yeah fun some uh, uh, some laughs some sexy <laughs> moments um, and um, yeah I, I agree I talk I'm talking about, about uh, a lot about uh, the non-issue of the lesbian couple, um, but uh, yeah, I think this is uh, the um, the between uh, comedy and drama. It's a lot more comedy, but um, I want them to love every every character in the movie. Um, uh, that they uh, really uh, in the present, like John said, really ha- would have hate if it was a drama. Uh, they uh, they will hate them, but now um, everybody will love them because the 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 flaws are really outside, and we have the non realistic uh, ending that things are getting better. But no, I really think in life also things are getting better. No? Every year is better. <laughs> oh, well, it's, especially 20 the year we've had. <laughs> <us crossed. laughs> yeah. And um, okay. let me let me throw the same question to you, Louise, um, because, you know, as the counterpart to Moran, what do you want people to leave feeling, thinking, believing? When you just asked the question, I th- just thought love. I don't know. It's all and everything, and we just feel good because of it. And I don't know, love yourself, love the others, love to be alive. My, it's a little a big answer concerning, but yeah, it's my answer. Yeah, it's true. I'm going to throw it to you, Rivka. Same question. I would like the people to say, the audience, it has to be continued. It's only part one, and your sure end has. <laughs> <laughs> I think good. I have I have the first scene already for the sequel. <laughs> okay. first scene, seriously. <laughs> well, there seriously, Sherelle, will there be a sequel? I don't think so. <laughs> well, my it life is in a way a sequel, but. Uh... <laughs> And John, I want to throw that question to you too, um, as well as Christine and Sherelle. What what is it that you want people to walk away feeling, thinking, believing? 
uh, to me the humor, the 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 joy of. Uh, I hope I hope they walk away with the same amount of joy we had making the film. Uh, it was a joyful experience. It was it was a wonderfully integrated experience. It was challenging and fun, and I hope that's the way people walk away from it. Uh, and uh, I would say the only other thing that occurred to me when you, when Louise was talking was, you know, people think that hate is the opposite of love and it suddenly occurred to me that it's fear mm. As, that's why at the end of the movie we have the fight it's not over hate it's over fear mm, and absolutely. um and i think that's a that's a much wiser way of looking at the problem mm, absolutely how long did it take to film the movie not long 27 long. shooting <laughs> 27 um, shooting days in total wow. unbelievable all right christine to you what do you want and hope people walk away with well so many brilliant things have been said and true things but um one of the for me i'd say that conflict can be conducted in kindness we don't have to we don't have to share opinions or lifestyles or point of views but uh, and they can be polarized in a way, but uh, uh, there is a dignity to a conflict. And I hope that, that um, yeah, this film can have the audience walk away with the feeling that they can go into conflict with each other, but do it with kindness. And Sherelle, you get the last word. What do I have you to agree hope? with Christine on that. I really do, because... Um, also, at the end of the film, uh, Moran's character said that it's a, it's a beautiful chaos, and I think that we should learn how to 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 enjoy the fact that it's it is chaotic, but there is beauty in that in disagreeing, and as long as we talk to each other, everything is fine. Mm -hmm. I love that. Well, all of you, thank you so much. You have given us more than you even know from the the, the writing, the producing, the acting, all of it. I mean, this is a film that I think will stay with us forever. And congratulations on your North American premiere of Kiss Me Kosher at the Atlanta Jewish Film Festival. Uh, Thank you. I know this is going to be like wildfire. And I think you're going to have to do a sequel. I am just saying. <laughs> 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 Thank you all. Be well and be safe. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. Thank yeah. you. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye.